said, here's your only assignment. I want you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit for a picture of what he wants to do with your life. And I was like, well, none of my friends at Indiana State or U of I are going through this experience right now. And I thought, that's weird. But, and I was that kid that we were talking about activations and prophecies and all this stuff. And I was, um, I was four and I told my dad, I really want to know Jesus and feel like I'm going to heaven. And so he prayed a prayer with me. Um, Couldn't wait to get my Precious Moments Bible so I could read it. And I was a little like my mom. I just wanted to love Jesus and do it all right. Does that make sense? And so when we experience all these things of the Holy Spirit, I was so afraid I would do it wrong. So prophecies and activations weren't super exciting. I mean, we'd sit in a circle and you'd close your eyes and you'd, and you'd ask the Lord, is that a red ball or a green ball in the middle? If you're not used to that and you're here, I'm sorry. I know it's weird, but it doesn't need to be. Okay. But we would do that. And I remember sweating and thinking, I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to get it wrong. But Jesus, I love you. Please know that I love you. I was so scared. And we'd watch dad, we'd go to Walmart and He'd ask the lady how she was doing at Walmart, and he'd say, she'd say, I have a headache. And so he'd say, we're just going to pray till it goes. And I would say, okay, we're connecting her heart to Jesus, but the 17 people in line behind us (laughs) may be (laughs) disconnecting. And so we're like, okay, we're just bringing it all around. And I was so afraid I wouldn't get it right. And so I... I remember, like, feeling like everything had to be right. So I went and got alone. I turned on, like, the most emotional worship song I could. I was going to, like, set the mood. I couldn't have anybody around. And the Lord gave me this vision, and that was of a bridge. And he showed me these people. You can go to the next slide. He showed me a bunch of people on a cliff, kind of like that cliff. And I got to experience that in real life later. But he showed me this picture of a cliff, and there was another cliff. And I knew they wanted to get to the other cliff. And my job, and in this vision he gave me, I was like a troll, (laughs) but I was building a bridge. And I just kept putting the pieces of the bridge so that they could get to where they wanted to go. My senior year of college, Jeannie Mayo, some of you know, um, a lady who had come and spoken at our chapel and would speak at Acquire the Fire. She was super well known, and in my mind, just a celebrity. She sat in that little $800 car with me. that Pastor Don helped me buy, and she said, the Lord's told me there's a book inside me, but it's like I'm standing on a cliff, and I can see it on the other cliff, and I've asked him who can build the bridge, and he said you. So at 22, I packed my whole life up into two boxes and a suitcase, much like my brother John and sister-in-law have just done, and I moved to California. And so I've spent the last year getting on and off like the hamster wheel of life. There's a lady named Brene Brown who writes a lot of books, and she talks about the hustle of life. That sometimes we jump into this mode where we're trying to get stuff and accomplish things. And it's a, and it's a lot like climbing a mountain, right? Life feels like I'm just getting to the next level, the next promotion, the next raise, the next car, the next house, the next job, the next kid, and it just feels like you're not sure where you're going. And I live in the suburbs of Houston, and I live in a nice neighborhood, a neighborhood that I'd never seen one like it when I was a kid. I didn't know existed. I told someone the other day, people argue about what, like, the right color of granite countertops, and I was like, this true story. I didn't even know what granite was, so I was probably 22. But I watched a lady who lives in a house bigger than mine and nicer than mine, drives nicer cars than me, about two months ago, I saw sirens, lights flashing by, and I saw all these cars lined up, and an ambulance, and then another police car, another police car, another police car, and I watched a woman run out of her house and wail on her front step, and I found out the next day she just discovered her husband and he killed himself. The truth is what I think happens sometimes is in the hustle and in the climb, we're climbing, we get to the top and we go, is this it? I did all the things I wanted to do. I got all the things I wanted to get. I have and I've done and now is that all? We know that Moses went into the wilderness 
right? And it was supposed to be about the promised land. But the truth is, Moses is one of the few people in the entire Bible that is called a friend of God. And Moses said, I'd rather be in your presence than in the promised land. Because the presence is the promise. Does that make sense? I want to go to a couple scriptures. You can go to that next thing. I feel like sometimes, okay, I'm a teacher. If you have a piece of paper, write this down. You don't have to. I have to have fill-ins because I love it. I don't have to. The Lord will free me if I don't need to. Some of these we may skip through. Okay, I want you to go to the next time. Here's the reality. Sometimes we find ourselves on a cliff of life because of sin and because of circumstance. Okay? Sometimes life just happens, right? In charismatic circles... We want to cast all the circumstances out, right? I'm in a hard place. I want to do hard things, right? I'll tell you in 1993, we did not. In fact, I'll tell you a true story. My mom was good at helping us all work together as a team, and so we all kind of had roles. And I'll never forget, my mom and my brother John had it out in the kitchen one day, and John finally said, please don't ever ask me to do the dishes, because I'm never going to want to do the dishes. <laughs> if you tell me to do them, I will do them, because I want to live a long life. John's very logical. And if I honor you, I will. So I'll do them. But I'm just not ever going to want. And I'll tell you, there are moments, and my brothers will tell you this, of all the things we didn't necessarily want to do. But when your parents live and love well, it's hard not to jump in. And out of love, you want to do things with them. Sometimes, but sometimes we don't want to do hard things. There are a lot of camps of religion that say, I'm just supposed to stay in my circumstances and, it's, and not ever ask, not ever get out. And actually, the more bad things that happen to me, the better I am because I endure them and I don't complain. Does that make sense? Like, I'm, I just want to be a living martyr, so I want to Yes, I want all the bad things to happen. And then that's all God's perfect will. And then if I don't complain, I'm super spiritual. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? And there's a bridge, right? Sometimes, so I don't know where people are at this morning, but I do feel like, and then I've worked with teenagers for 15 years. They, they want to love Jesus, serve Jesus. I want God on my life. I want him to get me in the college. I want him to get me the guy or get me the girl. Now, if the girl does love Jesus or not, that's probably negotiable. <laughs> then they end up in a really ugly relationship. And they go, how did I get here? I'm like, well, a lot of bad decisions. And the bridge out is grace. And we find that in his presence. But we can't look around and go, listen, I lied, cheated, sealed, and now I don't understand why good things aren't happening. How did I get here? I saw with a lot of teenagers, I'll go, listen, a lot of bad decisions. We want, like, we live in a world where if I just have the right YouTube video, I'll go viral. <laughs> right? We want that so bad. But the extraordinary in the kingdom really is about little ordinary moments. It's doing the right thing when no one's watching. It's not always about corporate worship. We're going to talk about private worship. You can go to the next one. I want to look at two people. Um, and we may not get to Leah. I love Leah, but I want to look at the life of David. And I'm going to, I'm going to make this actually a pretty quick. Um, I have a couple scriptures, but I'm just going to focus on Psalm 73. And then we're going to jump to 1 Samuel and really look at what's going on with David. But let me read real quickly. And I'm reading in the message... David is really honest with God, and that's something that I learned and have learned over the last 20 years, like just to be really honest. A couple, I don't know, it's been a couple months ago. Is Jaden in here? No? Okay, good. A couple of months ago, <laughs> I had a moment as a parent, and I have a, I have a pretty good life and we go through ups and downs but I have good kids and they've had good experiences we put them in a big public school which should have scared us but we had a piece about it and um, Jaden's in fifth grade it's his last year at elementary school and I was driving down the road um, to my class to teach and I saw this thing that said bike sale 
And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, you have to buy him a bike today. And I thought, well, that's kind of weird, but okay. So I called my husband and said, hey, is it okay if I get Jane? I'm going to take Jane after school to get a bike today. Well, sure enough, after school, his best friend comes over and he says, is Jaden still mad at me? And I said, what do you mean, is he still mad at you? And he said, well, he was showing our friend Isaiah what this other kid was doing to him. And I told on Jaden and said, hey, Jaden pinched Isaiah. And I was like, okay. And so Jaden got home and I started probing a little bit and asking questions and and so, anyway, long story short, there's this kid who's been hurting Jaden every day. And he just, like, tries to grab his skin and twist it as hard as he can. You know, one of those things, like a kid that flicks your ear or that. But every day, every day, and Jaden didn't tell anybody. And, you know, everything in me is, like, angry, like, as a mom. Because, you know what? It'd take me a hot minute to find out who that kid is on Facebook. <laughs> And I could do it in a real, like, real passive-aggressive, like, everybody knows I love Jesus. So I just want to reach out, connect with that parent, because I'm sure they're good. And I want to know if their heart's connected to their child, because, and we just want to pray for that kid, but I want to know who he is. And I mean, it would take me all of, like, I'm not exaggerating two minutes to know where he lives who his parents are, and what his favorite toy is. I mean, I, that's where I'm at. And the Lord reminded me, and I'm trying to just breathe. And finally, I realized in that moment, Jaden felt like, I'm a good kid. I don't stir up trouble. I don't want to make trouble for my teacher. I don't want to do anything. But in that moment, I thought, okay, here's your, this is an opportunity. And I hadn't told him about the bike. So I just sat there, and we just cried together. And I said, that sucks. Because you know what? When people hurt you, when disappointment happens, it sucks. And to pretend it doesn't is not fair. And you know, I love that David didn't. So let me just, so um, let me read this quickly. I'm going to read it in the message. But I'm going to start with, I'm going to jump ahead. I'm not going to read um, too much. But here's, I'm going to start with two. David says, He starts by saying, no doubt God's good. But he said, I nearly missed it. I missed seeing his goodness because I was looking the other way. I was looking up to the people at the top. I was envying the wicked who have made it, who appear to have nothing to worry about, not a care in the world. Pretentious with arrogance, they wear the latest fashions and violence, pampered, overfed, decked out in silk bows of silliness. They jeer, using words to kill. They bully. They're full of hot air, loud mouths disturbing the peace. People actually listen to them. Can you believe it? You ever envy people? Feel like they have everything? We live in a society now. Two people recently, Kate Spade, Anthony Bourdain, I had a, who are famous, who are intellectual, who had achieved everything in this life possible, fame and fortune, and they both took their own lives because they got to the top and they said, is this what it was about? David says, what's going on here is God out to lunch. Nobody's tending the store. The wicked get by with everything. They've made it, piling up riches, and I've been stupid to play by the rules. In fact, in the New King James, it says, I've cleansed my heart. I've done the right thing in vain. Was it worth it? That's what he's saying. Was it worth it? Because I could buy into that other system, and we could just go head to head. But is playing by your rules, God, really worth it? Then he says, what's it gotten me? A long run of bad luck, that's what. A slap in the face every time I walk in the door. If I'd have given in and talked like this, I would have betrayed your dear children. And this is what he says. When I tried to figure it out, all I got was a splitting headache. In fact, in another translation, it says it was a wearisome task. Do you know what will wear you out? Trying to figure out why people have what you want. Why they got what you didn't get. Why they're where you want to be. That's exhausting. And you have two options. You can get bitter. You can hustle and go, you know what? I live in Texas. This is how they do it there. By golly pull myself up by my bootstraps, make as much money, work three part-time, three jobs, I'll invest in everything, I'll own land, and then eventually I'll get it. I'll get there. Because you know what? If I believe in myself and I work really hard, anything is possible. You heard that? 
I'll tell you right now, in the kingdom, that's a little bit of crap. Because the Bible says that in Psalms 127, he who builds his house, right, lest the Lord builds it, they labor in vain. About two years ago, I broke down before the Lord and said, I'm done. I don't want to build anything that's not of you. I don't want to waste my time or my money or my energy if you're not in the middle of it. Because I don't want to get to the end and go, I wasted it. I wasted my life. I don't want to get to the top of the mountain and be disappointed. So here's what he says. I got a splitting headache. I was worn out. I was troubled until, and then he has what I call the but then moment. This is what we have to do in the but then is find our but then moments. But then I entered the presence of God. Not corporate sanctuary, all alone. He walked into the presence of God. Then he said, then I discerned, then I understood. Chuck's here, and his full-time job is to get people aligned physically. And he'll tell you, there's a bunch of weird pain you can have, and it all has to do with how your spine is aligned. Doesn't make any sense, right? I got friends who take their kids to chiropractors for earaches. I'm like, how in the world? Well, sure enough, they go away. Because your spine is the core. So I want you to think about, here's what I want you to know. Clarity of your, the clarity of your life and of your soul comes when you walk into the presence. It's like going to a spiritual chiropractor and somebody aligning it. I spend time with tons of college. I sat with an 18-year-old. Her parents make a ridiculous amount of money. She drives a Mercedes. And has a membership to a country club. And she goes, I'm applying to all these schools. I'm helping these kids write letters. And she finally looks at me, tears in her eyes, and says, I have this deep need to feel like I'm going to accomplish something important. But also I have this deep fear that I'm not going to have money. And then she said this, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to study law because I know if I'm an attorney, I'll make a lot of money. But she said, I've watched my parents live that life, and I already know it won't make me happy. How do I get off this roller coaster? And I said, listen, I know you want a 10-step plan, but you got to get alone with Jesus. The only way off that roller coaster is you going before him like David did and saying, I'm going to get in your presence. I'm going to align my heart so that I see perspective. Colossians 3 says, we're working for an eternal reward, not an earthly one. I have to check my heart all the time. What does this matter? And I, I went to my, um, my OB, and I was pregnant with my third. She was pregnant with her sixth. <laughs> and she said, I just really wanted, I had this desire to have one more. And she had a girl first, then she had four boys. And she just found out she'd had another girl. And she said, she got really vulnerable. You know, sometimes doctors are just all business. And she said, she leaned in and she said, I mean, I know kids are good, but am I, are we crazy? And I said, well, here's what I know. My mom always said to me, they're the only thing you can take to heaven. So they're worth the investment, I think. And it's true. When you're hustling, oftentimes we're looking. We live in comparison. We live in confusion. We don't know what we want. And then we look at each other and go, how did we get here? People say really nice things. Like, family's everything. My friends are ride or die, right? Things happen. And the truth is, that doesn't align your heart the way Chuck would align your back. It's not quite all the way straight. Only time in the presence makes sense. I've, there's a, a kind of a personality test called the Enneagram that I've been studying and going through with some ladies, and it comes back to Like, we're all kind of wired differently, which is biblical. We all want to find peace, which is biblical. And and it comes back to, like, nine core fears that we all have. And I've been going through these because I'm looking at at my life going, when was I trying to avoid something or to fill something, and I wasn't trusting God to do that? Does that make sense? Like, I, I can sit around and whine, or I can hustle. When am I hustling? And here are the core fears. The core fear is that I would be evil, I would be unloved, I would be worthless, I'd be insignificant, I'd be useless, I'd be without support or guidance, I'd be deprived, 
I'd be controlled or I'd be separated. And all of us kind of fall on that spectrum. And we look for worth, love, identity, control in a lot of different places. And there are a lot of socially acceptable ways to do that. We can make money. We can work out. We can look good. We can have friends. But none of that satisfies like Jesus. I'm going off a little bit. Jump to, I, wanna, I just want to read a quick story. I'm looking at my, my time. Um, here's what I, I don't normally, I'm not, I promise I'm not normally this scattered, but here's what I want. I want to read a story to you about David in 1 Samuel, because I believe it is, a picture of what God wants us to model after. David was in a war. When my granddad died, my mom, we were at the hospital. We just found out. My mom grabbed my hand. She, my mom says funny things at random times, and she doesn't usually slow down to talk to you. And um, she said, forgot to tell you life was hard. And I said, oh, it's all right. I mean, your life said it, so I <laughs> don't in her words, but it was this really sweet moment where it's like, you know what, sometimes it is. But God really wants us to know that our circumstances may not change, but our freedom and our joy can be there. I listened to a pastor of a church that's 10 minutes from me. There are 20,000 people. And he said, listen, all this stuff is fake about wealth and prosperity and health. And he said, God doesn't want you to be happy. And I was like, what is that? The truth is, we live in a world where people are experiencing the highest levels of depression. We have more than we've ever had. We have more friends on Facebook than we've ever had. We're connected to more people, and yet we are more alone, psychologists say, than we have ever been. Ever. And that's because for some of us, we've all gotten into the hustle. Some of us, we're afraid to connect with people, but really at the root of it is we didn't align our hearts with the Father. We didn't know that our love and our belonging and our worth was in Him and that that empowers us to live in freedom. It, is, it empowers us to live in joy. I'm going to read quickly. Here's what's happening. David has a bodyguard named Achish. And there's this moment where David and Saul are going back and forth, and Saul's taken off to try to defeat the Philistines. You'll know, remember Goliath? Goliath was a Philistine. And Saul's up against all these men, and he's terrified. David's trying to figure out, do I go fight? Do I not fight? And David's looking at his bodyguard, and he's saying, um, his bodyguard says to him, surely as the Lord lives, David, you have been upright, and you're going out, and you're coming in with me in the army is good in my sight. For to this day I found... I have not found evil in you since the day of your coming. Nevertheless, the lords do not favor you. Therefore, return now, go in peace, that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. So he's asking him to kind of run. And David's saying, what have I done? And to this day, what have you found in your servant as long as I've been with you, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord, the king? And he's saying, I want to fight the Philistines. So Agish says, I know you're good in the sight, as good as an angel, and then he says, nevertheless, go. So David goes back, and David comes back to Ziklag. So he heads south. And when he gets there, I'm just going to summarize this. It says that this, everything was burned to the ground, and all the women and children were kidnapped. So David comes back after going and doing what he thinks God's called him to do, and he's lost everything. His women, the women and kids are gone, and everything's burned to the ground. Here's what I felt like the Lord told me this morning, and here's the thing that I think two parts I want to say, and I'm going to forget the rest of the, <laughs> you can go to, we'll go to the last slide. In that moment, David experienced disappointment. So here's what I want you to hear that he did. So David, they arrived, and David and his men, First Samuel 30, verse 4, David and his men burst out in loud wails, wept and wept until they were exhausted with weeping. So disappointment happens, right? I mean, think about, like, just imagine your house burned down and everyone you love is gone. And David doesn't say, blessed be the name of the Lord. He just cries. Cries until there's nothing left in him. He empties out every emotion he has. 
And then, here's what I want you to hear. And then, David strengthened himself in the Lord. David got alone in the presence of God. And that word, I'm gonna, I wrote it down. Strengthen meant to become strong, to strengthen, to harden, to prevail. When we have disappointment, this is what I felt like the Lord said to me today. The enemy wants to take your disappointment and turn it into deception. I'm going to say that again because I don't have a slide for it. The enemy wants to take your disappointment and turn it into deception. He wants you to hear this. It wasn't worth it. God doesn't really love you. He doesn't really have good things for you. He's not really for you. It's on you. You have to make this happen. You've got to figure it out. But let me just tell you, here's, my other, here's the other thing I felt like the Lord showed me. David strengthened himself in the Lord. He got alone in the presence. He had his but then moment. He wept. He was honest about how bad it sucked. And then he got alone with Jesus. In 25 years, I've watched my mom and dad have people walk in and out of this church. It's the truth. Some probably for valid reasons. Some not. I don't know. It's hard to stay. But with every disappointment, there's a chair that my dad will sit in and pray in, and I'll have this image one day when he dies of him just laying there talking to the Lord. And I would listen to my mom worship at that piano. Sometimes while she cried, till we fell asleep. And then they get up and do it again. Here's what I love. David said, he cried out. He got alone with the Lord. And then he went to the priest, got the ephod, and he asked the Lord what to do. He got alone in his presence, and then he said, Graham Cook says, what does this mean and what should I do? Then he said, Lord, what do I do? Do I go pursue the Amalekites? Do, is that what you want me to do? He was willing to get back out there. Does that make sense? Sometimes we don't want to get back out there. We don't want to be obedient. We're okay to put on worship music and feel good, but then we'll ask Facebook what to do. We'll ask our neighbor what to do. We'll ask the smartest person we know. We'll ask someone we think will help us, or someone will just make us feel good. But I'll tell you what, you get in the presence of the Lord, and you say, Lord, what do we want me to do? And I choose obedience over outcome. I'll do what you want. I'll love that. In law, I'm just using general terms. Please, all of you, don't let your heads run. Okay, it's a little true, but I'll love them whether they love me back. I'll show up on Sunday morning when it'd be way easier to, to sleep in. I'll choose obedience over outcome. Lord, what do you want me to do? So here's the short story. He went and God redeemed it all. Read seven verses down. He got his wives back. He got his cows back. He got his sheep back. He got it all back. I don't get to preach in my church. He got it all back. It all came back. But here's the truth. When the enemy wants to turn your disappointment into deception and tell you, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. God's not worth it. He's not enough. You need that guy or that girl or that job or that amount of money or whatever. When, he, when you say, I refuse, I refuse, here's what the Lord told me today. Your greatest success is on the other side of your greatest disappointment. Your greatest success is on the other side of your greatest disappointment. When you get back up and say, I still choose you, I still choose what's right, I'm not going to get alone and get drunk and listen to another country music song and feel sorry for myself. Hello, I was 18 too. Okay, I wasn't drunk at 18, but you don't have to be to feel depressed with that stuff. 
Listen, I'm telling you the truth. People look at me, and I have teenagers now that go, how did you? I, I came from a town, 700 people. I didn't know. I had a dream to do a lot of stuff. I didn't know anybody that did it. I said, what's the bridge to my destiny? And Jesus said, it's in my presence. It's in walking with me. It's in doing the next right thing. It's in allowing your life to line up with what is true and holy and right. It's in making right decisions when nobody's watching. I talk to teenagers, so I use lots of examples, like in the backseat of that car, when your parents aren't around. It's in not gossiping and not lying and not doing it, just getting alone with Jesus saying, what do you want me to do? And trusting that there's success. I'm going to finish with one story. Um, I was asking Dad because I wanted to get it right today. I think I shared this story at, at my church a while ago. Twelve years ago, my dad went to pray with his cousin who grew up like a brother. His name was... Greg, his first name was Paul. It's part of who Stephen's named after. And Greg was, and dad were the same age. They grew up, there used to be a song called Two Sets of Joneses. Do you remember that old song? Um, This is a song about two sets of Joneses, and one built their life on Jesus and the other didn't. Greg and Kelly were good people. They had four kids. Greg started a business, made a lot of money, built a beautiful house, put his kids through school, and nothing wrong with that. But by the time he got to the top of the mountain, he didn't have a lot of time left. They diagnosed him with pancreatic cancer, and he looked at Dad and said, if the Lord will heal me, now I'll go on the mission trip. Now I'll do those things. So when it got really bad, Kelly, his wife, called my dad, and Dad went and prayed and prayed. And I don't think Dad told this story for a while, and And he didn't talk about it a lot, but he said, I prayed in every language I knew to pray. Prayed till I lost my voice. And Greg died. And those kind of disappointments sort of rock you a little bit. And they can make you start to believe that what you bought into may not may not be for real. But it wasn't long after Dad was telling a story, and I was asking this morning where they were in Africa, and a lady came forward, and he said her stomach looked just like Greg's. The same kind of tumors, same kind of cancer. Dad said yesterday that he, he just wanted to know the character of God and really understand it for us to know how much the Lord loves us. This is the lesson that I learned We don't let disappointment shape who we are or how we see him. And that's a fight sometimes. And he chose to pray and he chose to believe and God supernaturally healed that woman's stomach. And the tumors went away. Here's what I want you to know today. Here's what's just burning in my heart. Corporate worship is great, and I love it. I love it so much. Should be. But daily, we have to get alone in the presence of the Lord and let him align our hearts. When we start to feel anxious, fearful, worried, I'm, I don't know, six weeks, you probably saw on the news about the Santa Fe, Texas shooting. I knew kids in high school. And teachers who love those kids. And listen, one of my best friends in her small group, the man was right next, her, her small group friend's right next door, and he talked about hiding kids in an attic crawl space while they listened to the shooter kill those kids in the art room. We lived it up close. But David said, I'll live to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And when we get alone in his presence and we allow ourselves to just be honest and raw and vulnerable and then say, Lord, I need you to fill me up. I'm going to strengthen myself in you. It doesn't come from me. It has to come from you. And I want to build my life on your love and your truth. And disappointments 
won't allow me to get deceived, but I know that God honors faithfulness on the other side of disappointment. Always and forever. Because Colossians 3 says it's about an earthly reward, not a heavenly one. Um, okay, I was like 35 minutes. I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to pray. If you want to pray, I really feel strong. Like You may not sit around today. I think sometimes in this moment we forget that really it's about daily connecting with the heart of the Father. So if you want to come and just pray, I'm happy to pray. But I believe the Lord wants you to know that he loves you. And if you haven't spent time with, you, with him, he misses you. And I don't know if you're on a cliff. I don't know if life isn't turning out the way you hoped it would or the way you thought it would. I don't know. Or maybe there's sin in your life and you're asking yourself, how the heck did I get here? There's a bridge to freedom. There's a bridge to peace. There's a bridge to joy. And it starts in his presence. And he'll tell you what to do. And you've got to shut out the noise. Turn off the electronics. And just listen. And what he has for you is good. It's so good. Heidi's just going to sing. I'm going to turn this off. If you want to pray, come pray. If you want to go home and pray, go home and pray. I believe God has really good things for, for seas. I just want to add to that because Ann had a word and, and uh, Cindy too. Anne was talking about a cliff, <laughs> and she just felt like you know, for the church, you know, that part of that following God is He takes you to the edge, but you have to jump. He rarely pushes you off. You have to make that choice. And, and Cindy said, you know, this morning I just kept seeing, you know, today's day, seven is, you know, is that number of completion but it's one it's the first day and so I felt like what what Leslie was saying for some in here maybe for for four C's it it is a new day it's the first day of of a new time and uh, so just want to do that here's what I'd like to do would y'all stand because I know it's it feels kind of awkward do I go do I stay kind of you know uh, we're going to pray like we normally do, but if you want prayer, you want Leslie to pray with you, uh, you just come up and she'll be happy to do that. The prophetic guys will be in the back. But otherwise, go and, and have a great day. And what she said is so true. Practice it. Do it. Grab the hand of the person next to you, and we're just going to pray. And, uh, and you just be obedient to what he's speaking to you. Father, we thank you today for your word, for your truth. Thank you, Lord, for the example of David, who was real. He was all guy. He was in love with you. And you, even after all that stuff, you said, this is the guy who was after my heart. Father, may we be like that. Lord, I pray for anyone who needs to make choices today. I pray for the courage to make the choice. Whether that's just open up, letting people pray, whether that's just coming up here around the altar, Lord, and just getting before you. Lord, whether that's leaving this place and maybe making a phone call or making a decision what they're going to do this week. Lord, we just ask you, God, to give them that courage. Lord, we just bless these hands that we hold and we pray, God, your best for them. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. If you want, if you want prayer, please come over here.